Our guest is uh, Julia, Dr. Julia Gomula. She completed her PhD at the Department of Social and Com Communication Psychology here at the university. Thank you very much, Josephine. Um, thank you for having me. I was very excited um, when someone approached me saying, hey, we've got this alumni from, for students um, format. And uh, I want to begin with, with saying thank you because not only for the opportunity um, of talking here, but also whenever I think of Göttingen, it feels like coming back home, even though I'm still at my home office, but it feels like I'm reconnecting to Göttingen where I had my um, once in a lifetime a time of four years um, doing my PhD um, with Margarete Bos and uh, Kilian Bietze. Um, so, I will start sharing my screen from um, the iPad and I will talk about creative careers and I stress the creative because that's what I did my PhD on, um, all dedicated to getting you closer to your Ikigai. And with all the, t all the things that we do um, as change architects as B. Brown, because that's what I am um, uh, currently doing, I work as a change architect and I will let you know what that is in a second. Um, but we start every meeting um, with a check-in and before that I'm going to show you an agenda because I thought maybe it's good to see some, some structure before. Um, we will do the check-in with Mad T. Mad T is a, is a format from the liberating structures. And um, I love doing that. We will see that in just a second. Then we will have a little survey because um, Josephine and I, we weren't sure, would you rather want it to be more interactive? Let's have a workshop kind of thing. Or do you want a monologue uh, from me talking about my research, talking about my journey, talking about Ikigai and um, more like on a theoretical, but also with practical implications kind of way. So we have two concepts prepared and which way we go depends on um, how you um, put your votes in this little survey. Then, obviously, I will have a very short company presentation about B. Brown. Um, I will show you something about my job versus the roles that I have. Also, some about where I come from. And then we will switch gears. Depending on the survey results, we will either do the workshop or um, we will look on my path. Then we will have a Q&A session session excuse me and we will check out okay now follows the uh, little part about b brown so b brown produces a medical technology and also um pharmaceuticals also um let's say um disinfectants for example so the purpose of b brown is to protect and improve the health of people around the world with all products related to hospitals and uh, related to improving um, health of patients. It was founded in 1839 when Julius Wilhelm Brown purchased the Rosenapotheke in Melsungen. And the Rosenapotheke still exists in Melsungen, although it's not, um, not the, 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 the business of B. Brown anymore. And then things have developed pretty much um, with suture material. So for, for um, Closing wounds, sterofundin, plastic infuser was um, produced. The Braunühle, um, today it's called Introcan Safety. That's the um, cannula that stays within your veins. And that's probably the most known um, product of B. Brown. Then it was transformed into a stock corporation in 1971. We produce uh, Ecoflac and we have 30, 63,000 employees worldwide. Um, there are 18 therapeutic areas in which B. Brown's products are used from orthopedic joint replacement. So everything that's metal, metal in the, in the surgery, um, knees, for example, that's also part of B. Brown. But we're um, right now, um, infection prevention is a very strong, also infusion pumps, um, pain therapy, that's also nutri nutrition therapy wound management and as you can see there's 18 therapeutic areas and there's more than 5,000 different kind of products that B. Brown produces so we have a very very large portfolio of products. 
Our subsidiaries are in 64 countries. And as you can see, the headquarter is this little purple um, square that is surrounded by a green square. Maison is really close, actually. Um, from where I live, it's uh, 40 minutes of, of driving from Göttingen. It's like, I would say, an, an hour or maybe, yeah, maybe an hour. Um, what's my job title? Um, I think Josephine said, said that I was hired as the senior manager communications or senior communications manager. And um, to tell you the truth, I don't do much senior manager, uh, senior communication right now. Um, I have several roles and um, these are only my official roles. So roles that are really described and that I have either taken or that someone has given to me. Um, so most of the time I work as a change consultant and the circle that I work in my team, we are the change architects. This is why I put on the first slide, I put change architect. We support B. Brown in acting future oriented in a changing working environment by consulting and empowering teams and leaders to collaborate effectively and autonomously. And I think that about 80% of my working time is dedicated to doing that. Mostly I work with teams, um, now in a virtual manner, before Corona, it was on-site workshops and we lead or we accompany the teams for half a year um, on their journey towards agile working, towards self-organized working. Um, that's what I do most of my time. But I'm also the communication role of our tasks and teams enabling circle. I will not show you all the roles that I have. I just wanted to make sure that you know and already see that not all of this is conform with being the senior manager communications. What I was hired for two years ago uh, has changed and is changing. And also I am changing the way I work. This is a very important take home message for you. Where I came from, I thought that would be nice because the, the thing I just showed is what I'm currently doing, but um, I actually took an, a very old Zeugnis, I don't know what's, uh, what's exam, no, um, a degree um, from, from my childhood. And it's from the first grade, uh, so elementary school. And the teacher said, Julia has confident application ready knowledge in all subjects. She's very interested in class discussions, is able to express herself coherently. Her impulsive and cheeky manner often had a disturbing effect. She should be even more conscientious in her booklet management in the future. Although that's been 29 or almost 30 years ago, I would say that's still my personality. I'm still very impulsive. I wouldn't say for loud, cheeky. Um, and, and I think sometimes um, being loud and maybe disturbing um, is actually causing half the fun. And I am a change consultant, so I actually get paid for being loud and also uh, maybe annoying sometimes. I thought that that'd be nice. So now let's switch gear. That means we switch over to the talk now, and I'm using a different um, tool for that. I am choosing this. It's paper by 53. So um, I just wanted to show you some little biography stuff. I was born 1985 in uh, Magdeburg and my parents were a secretary and a carpenter. So I was the first one to study at all. Um, in 2001, I was given a scholarship from the uh, American Congress and the German Bundestag to spend a year in the United States. That's where I um, actually learned some, some of the English skills that were pretty, um, came in pretty handy later. And um, there someone told me when I was applying for that scholarship that they wouldn't think that I would actually get it uh, because of my heritage. And I still applied because I thought um, I don't have anything to lose. Then I um, graduated from the Edward Little High School in the US with highest honors. That's why there's this, this purple badge. Um, and I think I put it there because um, the American um, school system is not about learning facts. But when you are equipped with the German um, school system, then you know very many facts. And that actually came in handy for receiving highest honors. Then uh, two years later, I was granted um, Abitur, Hochschulzugangsberechtigung, so the certificate to enter university. And I studied at Magdeburg, so I, I stayed close to home. 
um, and I studied a program that was called cultural engineering. And that's basically everything and nothing specific. Um, I will show you later what cultural engineering was all about, but um, I chose that kind of study program. It was interdisciplinary. So there were um, parts from um, engineering science, there was cultural studies, there was um, knowledge management, there was even Wirtschaftsinformatik, so business um, informatics. And it was like a very colorful, oh, my, my iPad just went into sleepy mode, sorry. <laughs> um, it was very a very colorful um, study program. And I always had the, the problem that I couldn't um, actually explain what I was doing. I, I couldn't fit into a special category because I was everything and nothing. Um, but I think I learned over the years, I learned living with this uncertainty, not fitting in one specific scientific um, area, for example. And I also did my master's at the um, university um, in Magdeburg. Um, and also in 2011, we were, um, we got our first child. <laughs> And I worked as a HEVI, which is less than as an associate researcher. So HEVI is like, I don't know, studentische Hilfskraft. So like really, really little money. And to have some money, I worked as a waitress. I worked at a gas station. I also worked for a Christmas market. So I dressed as a nun and uh, gave out alcoholic beverages to German uh, Christmas market visitors um, just to get enough money. And then, I th and then I thought, well, we have a child now. I can't do all the other things that you do in your student life now anymore. I need a decent perspective for my life. And then the, the Georg August University of Göttingen, they had a, a offering of scholarships from the Hans Böckler Foundation, which is a foundation close to the um, Gewerkschaft Labor Unions. And I just went for it and um, I got it. <laughs> And I um, applied and then I joined the University of Göttingen. And at the same time, we were having our second child. And because I was so broad in my studies, I couldn't really focus on, on one specific area of, of um, my PhD res research. But I knew that for my PhD, I needed a very specific area of, um, of, 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 of study. Uh, and this is why I went into psychology, because now I knew psychology is a category, very easily understandable. This is a, a box where everyone could, could put me in, although I knew that I was uh, not a real psychologist. So I focused on design thinking and I focused on idea generation and on group processes, which I was very well equipped for because of my interdisciplinary study program. And I loved the time in Göttingen and it was the best time of my life. I did an internship with B. Brown in 2014 in the same department that I work in now. So this is a bell that I'm ringing here, keeping in, in contact, getting in contact and keeping in contact over many years um, paid out for me. Synapse is a program at the University of Göttingen for students, um, connecting students with local companies. I founded this program and um, so I went together with groups of students, I went to B. Brown and other companies like Sartorius or uh, Sumrise um, on a regular basis. So I built my connection to B. Brown over the time. And also I did mentoring um, in the mentoring program and I saw Dana Pfefferle in the call today. She was one of my um, fellow mentoring um, women in the Margaret Maltby mentoring program. And also I became spokesperson of the GGG, Göttingen Graduiertenschule Gesellschaftswissenschaften in English um, Graduate School Social Sciences. And we got our, uh, our third child and now with a family of five we're complete. And after that I founded Innovation for Breakfast together with Tanja Wehr and also my own company Ideenangler where I did um, or where I do design thinking workshops for businesses. Um, a proof that we did manage to get the three children, I'm not just telling you a story, this is my, my family on my sister's uh, marriage. And now I will dive into the creative part. I showed you some of the biography of me, but now I'm telling you something about the research that I've done because that relates to a creative career building. 
all that I've done um, in my research was based on the question of how do people get better ideas or best ideas? And brainstorming isn't the best way to do it um, because in the beginning, our brain associates those ideas that are very closely related to the ideation task. Um, this theory is called spreading activation theory by Collins and Loftus, meaning if I have vegetables primed in your brain, the possibility is high that you also activate cucumbers, tomatoes, peppers, lettuce, and other kinds of vegetables. But the probability for you to um, to activate, for example, helmets or blue lights or siren is low. And if you do that, then you have a, when you've, do, when you've done that, when you jump from peppers to protective clothing from firefighters, that's when you do a semantic cognitive jump. You activate knowledge that wouldn't be activated by the idea generation task. And this is the whole thing of um, becoming more creative and of having more original ideas. Not more ideas that are original, but ideas that are more original. Um, my research is very shortly, because I don't have the time to do my whole doctoral viva again, um, was based on two dependent variables. I looked at um, people created ideas in this or that way. And the ideas that were created were shown to um, randomized participants in an online rating study. So people were shown ideas and they were to rate these ideas on how original do you think that the idea is and how feasible do you think the idea is. And there was a scale from one to five on, on both. And then I calculated the um, originality mean per individual. So one individual has created, let's say, five ideas. There is one very original and the others are like mediocre original. And the same with feasibility mean per individual. Um, the ideas were nested in, in the individuals and the individuals were nested in different groups. That's enough to know about this page. Um, that's the whole setup of my of my PhD, four papers. Uh, that's, that's why I put four different quadrants. And um, I did a literature review before. I looked at all kinds of idea generation techniques, studies that were experimental or quasi-experimental. Uh, I had like 405 um, initial studies in my in my data set, and I had strong um, criteria of eliminating them. And in the end, 83 idea, um, 83 studies um, I looked at more closely, and then I looked at what kind of idea generation technique was compared to the other. Uh, all had to um, work with idea quality. So originality, newness, uniqueness, um, also feasibility, realization, all these kinds of quality measures that uh, go around ideas um, where the had to be the dependent variable to be included in my data set. And there I saw a pretty clear picture that analogy, for example, was one kind of um, idea generation technique that was never outperformed by any other technique. Um, analogy, analogy technique. So if I had to recommend one, then that would be it. Um, and I also saw that brainstorming isn't a very effective method. If you want to do brainstorming, do brain writing instead. Have them, have your participants at first write down their ideas all by themselves. Okay, long story short, that was my PhD. Um, I don't have to show you this. There was, um, in, my, in my experiments, there was a, was a significant difference. I'm looking on the left um, because I look at originality. There was a significant difference um, in the semantic jumps condition um, of my, of my um, participants compared to, to the control condition. And the control condition was just doing brain writing the semantic cognitive jumping condition was asked to do analogy technique or reverse technique or Mr. X technique. Feasibility wasn't differing um, significantly. Okay, this is a very short um, overflight over my PhD. And now I'm jumping into the design thinking framework because I think it's, it's useful to apply design thinking as a framework 
also um, to have creative career development. So I'm going to skip through these pages because all that happens is that there's one, um, one more asset jumping into the picture. So here's the whole model. We've got the emphasize, define, ideate, prototype, and test phases in the design thinking. And as you can see, there's, there's sometimes the arrow going broad and then sometimes it's, it's closing again, indicating that in the beginning, when we are in the problem space of understanding what's the need, and usually design thinking is applied for product innovation or um, digital service innovation, where we have a customer in mind, so someone else that we empathize with. But we can also empathize with ourselves, with us. So what is it that I need? What are my needs? What is it that I can do very well? What is it that somebody, um, wants me to do because he thinks I can do it pretty well. What is it that I'm drawn to? So empathize with yourself, that's the first step. And going broad. So think of many different ways. I will show you Ikigai just in a bit. And uh, empath 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 empathizing is um, about um, finding your Ikigai. Then that's the tough part, you have to go from all the things, all the possibilities out there, you should be um, focusing on one specific thing, or maybe two, or maybe three, but not a ton. And then you go broad again, ideate. What, what kind of way can I apply what I have learned about myself and the Ikigai? And then again, prototype. Choose some of the, um, of the ideas that you think are unique, that are not as conformist, but maybe go a different way than your fellow students, for example, would go and pro prototype these. Um, that's closely related to, to testing because um, when you have a prototype, you put it out there. Applied to creative career development, if you have a prototype and you think I should be trying that kind of path, that, then do it, for example, with internships. And you can have more than one internship on your, on your uh, biography. Okay, this is the Ikigai and I would recommend you to um, take a screenshot for later. Um, as I said, step number one is empathizing. Um, and the Ikigai is in Japanese, I don't speak Japanese, but uh, I'm told or have read that um, it means the reason to get up in the morning for or what draws me um, out of bed or even my mission that I want to accomplish. And it's, well, mission sounds a little bit, um, esoteric, I would say, because Ikigai is where also what you can get paid for meets with what the world needs, what you love and what you're good at. So I found it pretty easy to think of what I, what I love and also what I'm good at because people tell me what I'm good at. Or also, I can see it in my grades um, and, and ratings where I'm good at. But I think it's, it's more tough to find the crossroads with what I could actually get paid for and um, what the world needs, um, especially in these days, but uh, you know, like climate, what can, can we do for, for humankind, for example? So it's not easy. And actually it's pretty tough to um, find this very, very small overlap in the middle where Ikigai meets. Um, I'm assuming that you are students or that you are part of the university uh, universe. And um, this, that's why in the define step, um, you know, when you think of the design thinking, double diamond shape, in the define um, step, if you consider science your way to go, then as early as possible, read what is out there, read the status quo, and already start writing and publishing, um, and connect to a co-author, um, a supervisor, a senior researcher that you could um, work with to have your first paper published. Why? Because I was too old um, when I did my PhD because of all the things and, and workarounds and also having three children. Um, I was too old for a career in science, although I would have loved staying there because I have never experienced a time where I could follow my own interests 
as much as I could during my PhD and my research phase. So I was a little, if you ask me, what is it that you regret? Then I would say maybe I was too late um, to start with research. So you cannot be too young to um, find a gap uh, in research and, and practice um, writing proposals. Okay, now we come to the ideation phase. Why is that so blurry? Try a different picture. Okay, that looks better. Um, in the ideation phase, I'm sure you know mind mapping. So I'm a I'm a design thinking ideation kind of guy. Um, this is why I like doing um, mind maps also. And on the right, right you see my my study program, which was cultural engineering, and on the left you see psychology. And um, I just put around what are the, the the concepts, the main topics. So for example, for cultural engineering. There was business informatics, culture, educational system design, knowledge management, also logistics. And I've never actually applied to logistics ever again in my life. But there was innovation and there was idea engineering. And that was a very fun combination of having an engineering approach towards creativity. And in Göttingen, you don't have engineering. And that's why... Um, I was like an alien when I came to to Göttingen because in Magdeburg, where I studied, we have a very we had a very strong um, we still have it, but I don't work there anymore, so I speak in, in in past tense. So Magdeburg has strong engineering, and um, having this combination of creativity and engineering, like you could create ideas, like you produce cars in a in a, a factory that was pretty intriguing and that really stuck with me all my life. And I mean, until today, I'm still doing this kind of thing. Um, corporate culture was then actually where everything met, where psychology met with organizational development, with HR, with systemic coaching um, and stuff. So in the middle, that's actually where, um, where I focus most on right now. It's the corporate culture of B. Brown. And culture is a, uh, I, on, I only know the, the German quote, selbstgesponnenes Bedeutungsgewebe, after Clifford Gertz. In, in English, it would be like, it's a self-woven self um, uh, fabric, and you can only add a thread at a time. And it will take many, many threads and many rows until the whole culture will change. Step four, very important, mentoring. Um, I know that there are programs at the university and I would definitely recommend doing a mentoring program because for me, that was the actual, was the game changer. Um, and I put it in the ideation phase because back then I didn't, I, I didn't know which way to go. Should I go on science? Should I, should, I, should I stay in science? Should I go into the corporate world? Or with Ideen Angler, should I, focus totally on being self-employed and doing design thinking and um, innovation uh, ideation consulting. So uh, Ulla Heimeyer, she said, well, you need three mentors then. Go and find one mentor for each path. And so I st stayed with Margarete Boos as my research mentor. I, I looked for a mentor from being self-employed um, and I found Alexandra Schreiber. Um, and I well, then she said, well, now you need someone from the corporate world and uh, please look uh, in the area around Göttingen or somewhere where there's a woman um, that has really made a career in, in the corporate world. Uh, it should be, you know, like a board, a board level. So board member, look for a female board member. And then I looked and actually there was only one female board member in three hours driving time back then. And that was Dr. Bella um, from B. Brown. And then I said, well, th there's one. And then Ulla Heilmeier, she said, okay, I'm going to ask her if she wants to be your mentor. And I wouldn't have thought that she would actually agree, but she did. So I had three mentors and having um, for Dr. Bella from the B. Brown board was a game changer for me. 
because she was a role model and um, it was very easy to reconnect after my internship with the whole company and see how things have evolved and where the company was heading. And then I thought, well, maybe I should really apply if there's a job offering. And luckily there was uh, step five, prototyping. As I said, internships are roles and jobs for a certain time and um, you should definitely apply for internships. And even if the companies don't have open internships right now, you, sh you should still apply and still look for contacts within the company because oftentimes it's only the administrative work that keeps us from um, having, having created these job offerings. So um, I would always recommend contacting um, with a, a Initiativbewerbung. I don't know the, the English term. Um, like a self-motivated um, application. Student jobs, uh, I'm not talking about Hebe, so not, not the student research assistant, but jobs where you actually meet clients. Like I, I was a waitress that helped me really um, focusing on how people experience the time in the restaurant, you know, having a customer experience, you can learn from that. Freelancing, um, and I have read about gig economy, meaning that it's the time of having a normal contract for all your life with one company. These times are over and we are more heading towards short um, contracts and even many contracts with many um, different ways of, of being employed or different ways of, of making money. Um, also, prototyping for me was sketchnote trainings. I just wanted to show you the, um, the, the example from my corporate world because I learned sketchnotes from Tanja Wehr. She actually lives in, in Göttingen, in Gleichen, and she's a pro because she's written the sketchnote Starthilfe, so the way to start sketchnoting. And um, all the things I learned, I learned from her and then People from B. Brown asked me, well, you do all these funny drawings, can you teach me? And then I set up a whole training program and people really enjoy it. And every training program that I do is a prototype because I've never learned teaching sketch notes. I've never learned didactics or something like that. It's, it's a creation of a safe space where I can learn and also others learn. So what kind of change do I make for them? although it's not perfect and it's not uh, brilliant or 100%, it's prototyping. And my last uh, step is the test step, step six. And I wanted to close with a, with a little survey or a little study uh, from Amy Wisniewski from the Yale School of Management. She looked at cleaners in hospitals because B. Brown is uh, close to hospitals. That's why I thought that's a good, uh, good example. She looked at cleaners in hospitals and she saw from the way they answered to how satisfied were they with their job as a cleaner. They, she put them in two groups afterwards. So, so she grouped them after she knew how they answered. One group was not very satisfied and from what they have responded, she said, okay, they work for the paycheck. The paycheck, the extrinsic motivation, that's what makes them go to work. And then there was another group, they were very satisfied with the job that they did, um, or they were satisfied. I can't, see, can't say if that's very or, or, or more like medium satisfied, but they were more satisfied than group one. And for example, they asked one woman um, cleaning um, in rooms of coma patients because this woman was picking up pictures, moving them around, although um, it was clear that the patient wouldn't actually see that the pictures have changed or that the environment has changed and then they asked her is that part of your role and she said no it's not part of my role as a cleaner but it's part of me and this is what i bring to work so um the uh, the amy virzhnevsky she labeled this whole thing job crafting and redesigning the work that you do um and for me because it sounds pretty pretty high um, and also pretty lofty um, to bring that back on a practical manner i think you can apply that with role-based working as i said we ha i have one job and I have this little test uh, on the right, if you actually listened um, to what I was saying during the talk. So 
I have I had one job in 2018 and I still have the same job uh, until today. It's the senior communications manager, but I have I may, maybe I had two official roles being the change consultant and change communications. And as you could see um, earlier, I have more than eight roles now. And I would say inofficially because of sketch notes and all the other things, I would say I have maybe even 15. 15 unofficial roles in B. Brown. And with official, I mean, there's actually a template with responsibilities, with tasks um, dedicated to that role. That's what official role means in B. Brown. So the conclusion is, even if you are hired for a job, that's never the end of the story. You will always be able to create your job or create the roles that you like because of the things that are close to your ikigai, your, the things that are very meaningful to you personally, the things that the world needs. Also, these things change. What the world needs changed very fast during the last um, three months. And um, what you're good at, I mean, you all also have that under control. You can be better um, at different kind of things. This is why um, there's much more creativity than conformity in having a creative career. Okay, I am at the end of my talk um, and I promised you a questions and answers session. I will thank you and I want to thank you very much for investing your time because I think time is very, very precious. You can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. Question from Oliver. He said, "Why was there an age limitation for your scientific career?" There, there isn't an objective um, age limitation for my scientific career. But I was 33 when I finished the PhD, and I haven't had one single um, publication in a peer-reviewed paper. And I looked around and I thought, well, all the others that really make it into a permanent job at the university, they have publications already at the age of, I don't know, 29, um, ending with their master's, or some even have their PhD uh, at, at 30. And so maybe there isn't an, ob an objective um, Exp expiration date <laughs> of becoming a researcher, but I really felt intuitively, I felt I was, I was too late. Okay, great. Then there's a second question coming in from Julia. Also a first time student within my family. So sorry if I should know maybe, but what exactly is a mentorship? What are mentors um, for and how do you find some? How long does one get mentored? Uh, that's an excellent question, Julia. Um, so first thing, not related really closely to your question, but the first thing is and ask the most obvious questions. Ask them because we think or we perceive, we believe that everyone else knows, just we don't know. And how often um, does some do we ask a question and someone else thanks us because we've asked this question? So thanks for asking that question. Don't ever stop asking even the most obvious ones. Um, a mentorship is a mentoring program where you usually have one mentor. I had three, but you know, I'm more like the out, uh, out kind of uh, person leaving the conformity and doing things differently. Where you usually have one mentoring partner from maybe most of the time it's women with women. So young women taking on a mentor, um, also, also being women from the same um, profession or a, an area that um, the younger woman wants to evolve in. Um, and why women? Because it's said that, that, that men are naturally um, doing this kind of mentoring with each other. They don't need mentoring programs that much. That's what I heard. Um, because they have this networking skill better than, than women. So a mentoring program where you are for one or maybe one and a half years, you have this mentoring relationship with one older um, person can be most, 
female but can also be male and at the university of Göttingen, i think you have like four or five mentoring programs i don't know if that's for students or for um, phd students only yeah, um, i wanted to add to that there are several mentoring programs on Göttingen campus but also on the university of Göttingen. if you just google mentoring university of Göttingen, you will find kavi mento vivi mento dorothea schlösser it's uh, you have Brückenschlag, this is mentoring for people with kids or with a uh, migrational background. And so you have a lot of possibilities and it's people like Julia who agree to help younger students and give them kind of guidance. All right, then we have another question. How do you manage to make other recognize and hopefully even appreciate your work in unofficial roles? Hmm. So I don't really know what the what the question is really stressing because you could make unofficial roles official. That's the way that we do it right now because we want B Brown to be a more flexible, more responsive, more adapting company. And to get this um, this this flexibility, we say having roles crafted and then taken on roles, but also um, putting roles aside or someone else takes roles. Um, this this ev evolution of organizational structure, this is what we focus on right now because we think that that's helpful. Um, and appreciate you, my work, if that's what the question is stressing. So how can I make others recognize or appreciate my work? Um, let's say, um, and I'm, I'm not too long into, co into the corporate world, but I have learned that visibility is something that makes others recognize you and the things that you do and there are many different ways of being visible you can have either have a voice you can write um, with me i express my my things and as you as you've seen in colorful pictures handmade drawings and sketch notes this is the way i was was seen and then people start listening to what you have to say because they liked what you what you showed because of the things that you can do well. And then maybe they think, okay, she can also, maybe she has a good brain also. And maybe the ideas that she contributes will be helpful. I should listen to her more. Yeah, maybe also what you said earlier, um, Julia, is about passion. I mean, when you're passionate about something and you do it, then maybe it becomes more and more also your official and recognized um, task. Exactly. Right, then another question. Someone wrote, I'm almost done with my psychology master. What kind of practicum, vocational training would you recommend me to search for if I would like to go in a similar direction? <laughs> I love reading, reading these kinds of things. So um, for one thing, um, agile coaches, scrum coaches, organizational transformation, digital transformation, new work, it's like, this big um, these are the ways to to um, proceed and and when you think of the the double diamond from design thinking then you then you know then how large this field is you should really early focus on one thing um, and the way i do it i only pay attention to my twitter bubble because there I have many people from new work and I follow their recommendations because they're like pre-filtering all the things that are out there that are online. Um, and practicum, so internships, um, I think are always a good way to um, accompany a team. Like with me, with the change architects, um, we have interns not many but we have one intern and we really enjoy having her because she gives feedback and she um, co-facilitates our workshops she um, she's like a really good good person um, to have resonance from and i think that corporations are interested in having um, interns from especially if they've just finished their their masters in psychology then having an intern um, is interesting for us. How did, does you juggle the challenges of parenthood, motherhood with your studies and current job roles? <laughs> uh, I love having that question. Um, well, I would say 
having the kids um, during my PhD was the best ever choice I could make because I was still pretty young and I was finished with all my family planning at the end of my PhD. So when I applied to the job, then the hiring manager would be pretty sure that I wouldn't be become pregnant within the next two, three years, I would say. Um, that was one thing. Um, the other thing is, I have to be honest, last year I worked so much and I had one day of home office every week, which is already a privilege. But having four days a week where you are in, in the corporate, um, then you don't get to see your children. And I really had the feeling of being ripped apart inside from the mother role and the job role and I love doing my job. I love what I do. I wouldn't, wouldn't want to change um, anything of my job, but I also love being a mother and I also love my children. But now with the Corona pandemic for two and a half months now, I have been here in this very place every day, all day. Um, and I've kind of integrated family life into my corporate life. Every day I go for a run or a walk all by myself just to you know, reset my brain and my body. If I wouldn't do that, I would have probably gone mad already. So that's like one thing that I have as a ritual. Yeah, and other than that, I wouldn't say it's juggling. It's more like integrating, integrating everything. Can one area of the Ikigai compensate for another? For example, can identifying with something the world really needs lead to loving the job? Or should one have an innate passion for the job? Well, if the world really, if the world really needs what the job is offering, and I think that's a pretty lucky coincidence if that happens, because most of the time there's something that you love to do and that you could actually get paid for, but it wouldn't help the planet or it wouldn't help humankind. But if you find something that really helped the world, then I guess that is a purposeful job. And and then then I would guess that it could also be very easily related to from your personal motivation. Um, but if you if you cannot relate um, to what the world needs and to the purpose of the job, then I think that will not be um, designed um, artificially later. So you should really, really connect with the job and also with the with the company. I think it's a it's a strange strange twist because usually it's the other way around. There's companies that that actually lack the purpose that have besides making money they don't have the best purpose and they have a pretty strong challenge right now um, getting people on board and also keeping their employees um, motivated because they know that even the best strategy pictures are only um, lip lip service uh, if the purpose is I don't know burning fossil fuels and uh, destroying the planet Okay, then we have another question from Lisa. What would you do if you recognize at the end of your studies that you are interested in a totally different area than that you have studied? Well, um, if you have the energy, then I would definitely study something else. Because as I said, the gig economy is gladly taking us away from this one profession that you learn and that maybe even your father has learned before you or your mother has learned before you. But have a really a creative career and as I said you can choose between being conform or being creative I mean it's it's real, very stressing the point but um, maybe it's it's important to overdo uh, what I'm saying is um, you don't have to stay where you are you could and I'm, I'm assuming you are pretty young you could still redesign um, what you what you have because if you enter the company and even if it's at the age of 40, for example, still 27 years, you would be in that profession. And if you don't love that profession or if there aren't any roles that you could craft that you would love, then it would be a very sad period of time in your life. So yes, take the energy and invest another four or five years in um, doing something else. Okay. Financial situation, yes, that's that's a very a very important point. Um, there's scholarships, and I've had two scholarships in my life, and I haven't been that very special person from a lawyer. As I said, I'm a carpenter, 
uh, and secretary's daughter and my grandparents were gardeners and um, metal workers. Um, they didn't even know any terms that I used when I came back from the, from the universities. Um, really, really, please, please apply to scholarships. I've heard people say that more often. It's not about the grades and it's not about this and that. And I didn't believe them when they said that. But I've witnessed it. They're, they are always looking for good candidates. And good is not about just grades. It's also about what's your motivation? What is it that you want to change in the world? So they, they want to give you money. And um, you would help them if you applied. <laughs>